football on Off The Ball. With Sky, get more of the sports you love on Sports Extra with BT Sport and Premier Sports. I'm prepared to edit and I can't well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Now you're welcome along. Busy football show for you. Graham Hunter is going to join us in due course to give his perspective on events in Qatar. First, though, given events on Sunday, very happy to bring in Jonathan Wilson. He is amongst uh, other books, and we spoke to him recently about his uh, book in the Charlton Brothers. He is the author of Angels with Dirty Faces, the footballing history of Argentina. Uh, Jonathan, you're very welcome to the show. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for having me. How was your Qatar experience on the whole? (laughs) <laughs> um, uh, well, it was pretty terrible, frankly. Uh, I mean, the football was very, very good, um, but as a country, it's uh, it's a very, very difficult place. And um, everywhere you went, uh, every stadium, every mall, the metro, uh, every apartment building, you knew the, the the human suffering that had gone into creating that. So it was a it was a very, very difficult tournament to cover um, because of that. Mm. And was uh, seeing those various buildings and uh, World Cup Stadia in person, uh, did it almost bring it to life more, the, the suffering, or, or did you did you find it as um, troubling as you anticipated? Well, I think, I think what it brought to life was just how pointless it all is. Uh, I mean, obviously, when you're looking at a stadium, you you, know, you don't know how it's been built. You, you, we know that because of all the journalism around us. Um, but you know, why why was the Albite Stadium? Why why had somebody built this sixty thousand capacity stadium in the middle of a desert, forty kilometers north of Doha? What, what was the point of that? Who benefits from that? Why was the Lucille Stadium is eighty thousand or eighty eight thousand? I mean, how many it ended up being given the numbers changed all the time? Why was that stuck in this this sort of freakish new built city that that was almost entirely empty? Why? Why is that there? What's the point of it? And, and I think that was the thing that um, it, it, it's not just the way that those labourers were treated. It's not just the um, the conditions they worked under, the 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 difficulties they had getting paid, the lack of pay, the yeah, you know, the, the the issues with their passports. It was a sense this whole thing is completely pointless. There's no mm-hmm. legacy here. There's nothing uh, that's, that's going to endure. And, and this this sort of crushing detail that was constantly there, which is that Qatar is heating up faster than anywhere else in the world with climate change. And by 2070, it's going to be completely uninhabitable. And yet it goes blithely on with these huge construction projects. And you walk down, for instance, the Lucille Boulevard, this sort of, so, you know, they call it the Champs-Élysées of the Middle East, which is, oh, what, five, ten minutes walk from the Lucille Stadium. And the street is air conditioned. There's air conditioned parks, and you think all of this is just adding to climate change, which is the thing that's going to destroy the country. Did you stay on for the full duration? No, I, I, I got ill. Um, a lot of journalists went down with with a sort of flu virus. Um, I got it just before the quarterfinals, um, so I was just about well enough to do the Argentina Netherlands game, and then did the uh, England France game. And then just felt absolutely horrendous in the stadium. Yeah, you know, so three a.m. that morning, um, and I, I just sort of thought, no, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get home. Uh, so I talked to uh, various employers, and they sort of said, yeah, look, if you, it, there's no point sort of hanging around, sort of making it worse. So, so I, I sort of limped home with a week to go, and and um, so unfortunately, I, I missed the final. Which, uh, you know, whatever else I've been saying, the football. Some of the football was brilliant and the final was probably the best final we've ever seen. Yes, I dare say you're one of the few people around who's probably watched the full 90 minutes and beyond of every final there is available to watch. So does this one pretty much trump everything we've seen before? Well, it's, it's I mean, I have watched, um, I think I might say I've watched every minute that's available. So be pre, pre-Second pre World War, it's, you're down at pretty limited highlights. Um, and some of them, you know, the, the way they're packaged up, they don't seem to be quite in the right order. So it, it, that's pretty confusing. Um, and it's, it's. I think it's very hard when you're not experiencing it live to know what the emotions were and what the what it felt like. Um, so I think there's really only two finals that could compare. 
So there's the final in 86 when Argentina beat West Germany. Actually, a similar pattern to this game. Argentina went 2-0 up. The opposition get back to 2-2. And then in, in 86, Argentina scored that late goal through Boishaga to, to win it. Um, but yeah, this one had so many more layers of, of drama and excitement. So I think the only one that really stands comparison is the final in 54, when that great Hungary team had been unbeaten for four years, go, go two 0 up inside seven minutes against West Germany, and West Germany get it back and go three two up, and then in the closing seconds, Pushkas appears to have equalised, and it's ruled out by uh, a Welsh linesman, Bill Ling, uh, who gives it as offside. The camera angle it's imp- absolutely impossible to tell. It's it's close-ish is all you can say. Um, so so that was clearly huge dramatic. Was it more dramatic than this one? I, it's impossible to say, but they're, 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 that's the only one that's, that, that bears any kind of comparison, I think. Mm. So your book, Angels with Dirty Faces, the footballing history of Argentina, where does 2022 fit into, uh, I suppose, various attempts to put some kind of narrative on this uh, amazingly interesting and varied footballing country? Well, I, I think it actually does provide... A, a, I mean, I'm really hoping they let me do a, an updated version because one of the problems when you do a book like that is you're sort of ending it in the present day and you don't obviously you don't know what's going to happen next and, and it, it can be quite hard to sort of find a, a place for narrative to stop. Whereas this clearly, the, the, this is a, a cycle coming coming to an end. And it, it, yeah, that, that, mainly that's, that's the Messi cycle, Messi's five World Cups. Um, very few people get a story that good that they keep failing, they keep failing, they keep failing. And then at the very last, the very last moment, they they achieve this thing that, that that's really the only thing left in his career. And, and I think probably means more to him than anything else he's achieved in his career because it, it is for his country. And, and that slight unease which had existed between Messi and Argentina, I, I mean, that's diminished anyway in the last sort of five or six years. But but that sets the seal on this. You know, he he is a great Argentinian hero on the level of Maradona. Uh, but I think there's actually also an, another cycle there, which uh, in some ways is even more sort of fitting, that in 1995, Argentina went to Qatar to play in the World Youth Cup, um, and they won it. Uh, the coach was Jose Peckerman, his assistant was Hugo Tocali, and the two of them between them, uh, Tokali ends up replacing when Peckerman becomes the, the senior national coach. Uh, they win five World Youth Cups in, in 12 years, so between 1995 and 2007. And Peckerman changed how Argentina did youth development. And Peckerman's a fascinating character. You know, he drifted out of football, he became a taxi driver, went back into it. And he was obsessed by this idea that you, you can't just create players, you have to create people. And he he sort of preached this idea of of, of he was trying to make you know, a very holistic approach, trying to trying trying to improve his his young players as as men as well. Um and that was very influential and it, it produced you know, extraordinary numbers. If you think of all the great Argentinians of the last sort of 20, 25, 30 years, he 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 developed a, a lot of them. But the odd thing was they didn't have any success at, at senior level. It, they won the Cup of America in 1993. Two years later, they win this uh, World Youth Cup for the first time since 79. But for all the great players they have, they can't win the World Cup. They can't win the Cup of America. Uh, they managed to win two Olympics, but not the senior titles. Um, and, and that then yeah, feeds into the messy narrative, particularly 2014, losing the World Cup final, 2015, 2016, losing Copa America finals on penalties um, both years. Um, Tokali is eventually sort of eased out in 2007, and, and, and that production line of talent slows down. You know, If you look at the talent Argentina has produced in the last 10, 15 years, it's nothing like what it produced before then. And so there's only three players left in, in in this squad that came to under under Peckerman, and they're Papu Gomez, who, you know, who played a couple of games early in the tournament but didn't really make much of an impression. But then Angel Di Maria, who obviously was brilliant in the final and scored the second goal, and Messi. But not only that, Scaloni, the coach, he was part of the side in '97 that won the World Youth Cup. Mm. His two assistants, Pablo Aymar and Walter Samuel, they came to under Peckerman. So this is sort of like the the second wave of Peckerman that his players, these the, these these holistically produced players, are now becoming coaches. And so the the sort of gloom that Argentinian football has slipped into in the last sort of 
five, ten years, oh, we're never going to win anything ever again. We've had all these great players and we haven't won. Suddenly, with the end of a messy narrative and that success, there's also hope for the future that these great players can become great coaches. And you look at this squad and it, quite apart from Messi and Di Maria, the, the strength of it was the, the young players coming through. Uh, Julian Alvarez, who's uh, 22, um, Alexis McAllister, who's 23, and particularly Enzo Fernandez, who's who's 21. There is suddenly a new generation there. And I think even at the beginning of a tournament, you'd have been hard-pressed to, to, to see that coming through. And this is Jose Peckerman recently with Venezuela as head coach. Yeah, and he was he was coach of Colombia at the last World Cup when England when England beat them. Um, so people might remember him very sort of elegant, sort of gaunt, aquiline face. Um, I mean, he's he's some age now. He's he's sort of finished. But this this really is is. I mean, I was about to say it's his achievement as much as Messi's, which is clearly nonsense. <laughs> but it's 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 his. It's his generation of players. It's the end of the, that, 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 what, nearly a 30-year cycle that he yeah. initiated. Wow, amazing. I hadn't realised. He is 73, let the record yeah. show. And the fact that, you know, he began in Qatar and it ends in Qatar. So the the, the first three, um, the first three titles they won were at Qatar. There's one in Argentina and I think the other one was in, in the Netherlands, maybe. Um, but he named his three dogs after the three venues. He had a dog called Qatar after where yeah, his first great success came. So you're somebody who's in a hold of the book here, so it's a big old piece of work and I haven't had the pleasure of reading it. Can I give you the uh, a very casual at a glance uh, way of, of, of boxing these three World Cups together and you can tell me what strikes you about them and the parallels or the differences. So most of us would think... 1978 and we can see the Kempes goal and we think of the awful political situation which was the backdrop and that's its own in its own category and then we have a so-so team led by their genius left-footed uh, maestro wins World Cup and here in 2022 the parallels are irresistible and so we box the latter two together and we have 78 on its own and that's how I, I categorise them neatly in my head. What what would you say about these three World Cup wins? Yeah, I, I think that's, a t- from an Argentinian point of view, that's uh, absolutely the, the the way that they, they'd be regarded. I mean, the parallels between this and, and 86 are, are, are very obvious. Uh, I mean, it, it looked, you know, when Messi put them 3-2 up, it looked like it's going to be exactly the pattern of goals from the 86 final. Um, I, I, th- I guess if you want to look at it from a slightly different perspective, you can say there's obvious parallels between 78 and and now in 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 the where they were won and and the uh the enormous political issues surrounding the hosting i i think the players from 78 um there's a few of them sort of uh feel uneasy about that success they, they some of them are a little bit uh bitter that they feel they don't get the respect they deserve for it because it, it is such a sort of tainted triumph i think others feel it is tainted and and, and sort of um sort of questioning whether whether it was the right thing to do to to win it um and that's a very very difficult almost impossible question to answer because uh i mean it, the, the full extent of what was going on in argentina at the time wasn't known until much later people had suspicions but people yeah people didn't know and the line that that um that Menotti, the, the coach always came out with was he was doing this for the argentinian people and it wasn't for the state and he was very very um, specific when he gave interviews when he was talking about it, that he always spoke about the Argentinian people rather than you know, Argentina as a as a political entity. Um, Eighty six, I think, was was seen as a, bit a necessary triumph to say, look, we can we can win it when it's not at home, when it's not under a hunter, when there's not all these other issues going on. Um, and I I, I think. Uh, yeah, Argentina is a country that, that that is absolutely in love with its own history, and so if you want to find a link between '78 and this one from an Argentinian point of view, that Alvarez goal against Croatia, where he bundles through and and sort of yeah, the ball keeps on bouncing off challenges into his path and keeps on controlling it, and eventually he lashes in from close range, is very similar to Kempes's second goal against the Dutch in the final in 78. And so you know, immediately that happened, people were drawing that parallel saying, you know, that this is this is replaying 78 as well as 86. On um, 
Messi and Maradona. Uh, to what extent, because I'm sure you would have looked into this, to what extent has the cliche been true that Maradona, who was so um, evocative in his body language and so available and, and so um, fallible, that he was beloved and there was a remoteness to Messi, both in geographical and personality terms and, and to what extent has that latter issue been changed over the last couple of years was it as true because again it was the great cliche uh, was it your experience when you were writing the book that that was very much the case in Argentina because he Messi's so bloody glorious how did they not love him and <laughs> swoon at every turn well he wasn't glorious for them is, is the point which I guess makes it worse that um, yeah yeah, I, 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 yeah the, the comparison between them is very very difficult because Messi has pretty much every season for the last 15, 16 years, has been brilliant. Maradona had maybe three or four really great seasons. Um, and yet, in some ways, that, that makes him a more appealing character. The 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 the, the, the light and shade, the, the, the sense that his genius wasn't easily won, he was constantly wrestling with it, whereas Messi just seems to be a brilliant footballer who's brilliant cons- consistently all the time. And it, it, that, that remoteness you talk about, it's very hard to see whether even to derive much pleasure from it. Uh, and then uh, there's that frustration really up to about 2016. Uh, I mean, to say I just I hated him, as some people have, is, is way over the top. There was a scepticism. There was a sense of, does he really care about us or is he all about Barcelona winning Champions Leagues? Uh, does he really feel truly Argentine? There's all these the absurd sort of analyses of him singing the national anthem. Is he actually belting out properly uh, and yeah, you know, he he looks a bit shamefaced singing the national anthem as as most people do, uh, or as a lot of players do. Um, but yeah, he he speaks with an Argentinian accent. His wife is Argentinian. Uh, his favorite food is Argentinian. His favorite music is Argentinian. His favorite films are, are Argentinian. He 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 is very much Argentinian. And after that 2016 Copa America final, when they they've suffered that third defeat in a final in three years, when he's missed a penalty in the shootout against Chile. His obvious devastation after that is what persuades people in Argentina, no, he, he is one of us. Mm. And that is almost what gives the, the shade to his story. Um, and then really since 2016, it's been a question of everybody pulling together to try and give Messi his title. And Messi, I think, has, has really embraced that. And I think you've seen over the last two or three years, possibly, and you know, I've seen this argued for and against in Argentina. I'm not really sure I... I I know in my own mind what's right, but a sense that the death of Maradona, which is what, just over two years ago, two years and a month ago, um, that that's almost liberated him. He doesn't feel yeah, the eyes of Maradona on him all the time. And Maradona, of course, is such a visible presence at World Cups, be that as coach or be that as a, you know, as a, as a co-commentator or be it just as a fan. And, and Messi has definitely become a more vocal leader. Uh, that was apparent in the Copa America last year when they finally ended that drought, going back to 93, and it was definitely apparent here, albeit in a very, a very messy way. So, yeah, Maradona was a, was a was a great one for sort of coming up with these incredibly sort of um, punchy insults, and yet and Messi's yeah he's the complete complete opposite of that. So, after the the game against the Netherlands, when there's all that sort of to and fro between the the Argentinian players and the Dutch players, he says something like, "Oh, go away, you fool." And it is it is that mild. It's, it's sort of it's almost pathetic, mm. and yet somehow has uh, greater meaning because of that. Oh, it does. I mean, in the aftermath, people were saying, "Well, he's Argentinian now." Uh, was kind of the refrain in this part of the world. But I but Argentinian with a very sort of polite, slightly <laughs> meek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, of course, is the other difference between him and Maradona. That Maradona came from the streets, and Messi. I don't think he was rich, but yeah, you know, he, he his father was a, a manager at a factory. So he, he's somewhere between working class and middle class. Um, and that, I think, is another reason why there was that scepticism about him, that he didn't he didn't quite fit the cliche of, of the P-Bay dragging himself up from the slums. To what extent does this World Cup win elevate Messi's legacy, which was quite the legacy already, it must be said? Oh, I think it does. And, and I'd sort of always argued against this. Cause, I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of absurd that you say they'd lost that penalty shootout. Yes. Does that make him a worse player? Well, this is the absurdity. Well, yeah, I totally well, obviously, agree. Well, obviously it doesn't. Yeah. And yet... And yet. The, there were two great players in history, Pelé and Maradona, and they both won the World Cup. And nobody surely now doubts that there are three. 
and it needed that World Cup. It needed the end of that narrative. Now, maybe, you know, maybe if he hadn't won it, he'd have gone on to win the Champions League with PSG and you'd, we'd have said, oh, that's enough. Um, but I, I think, I think, yeah, stories need their ending and, and the sort of the great operatic drama of that second half and extra time, the penalties, it, it, it did consecrate his greatness. Whether it needed it or not, it, it did it. When we talk about Maradona's um, failings, even in his failings, they seem somehow to uh, make him more likable. Messi, that more remote figure, his failings, if, if we're to call them failings, they centre around his financial relationships. They centre around the tax fraud in Spain, um, you know, absolutely more than happy to take the millions from Qatar via PSG and absolutely needlessly, completely needlessly happy to take dollars from MBS as well to push a Saudi agenda, a, a, a worse regime than Qatar. Uh, to what extent does that muddy the water for you and for Messi? Because in the main, across the world, it doesn't seem to have dented his standing an iota, really. And and I must confess, even just from a personal point of view, for me, it, it makes me very standoffish towards him. I can't love him fully. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'd be pretty much in the same camp. That um, I think I think Maradona's flaws at the time uh, caused people to question him. I mean, his right. treatment of of women was was in some cases pretty shameful. His his treatment of his children was shameful. You know, shooting at journalists with an air rifle. Um, I guess some people think that's quite funny, but at the time it was a huge scandal. Um, and there's definitely after he failed the drugs test, there was a sense of uh, you know in the '94 World Cup uh, and and, I, and earlier as well, actually in '91 at Napoli. I think there was a, definitely a sense of some Argentinians losing patience with him. But then, of course, time passes, and and it's easier to to sort of rationalise him as this as this troubled genius. Um, and, and I I think it's something that 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 football as a culture, maybe the world as a culture, is is quite bad at is acknowledging that geniuses can have their, their, their bad sides and that it's not a question of just this man is good, this man is bad. Th these are complicated pictures. But I, I'm with you with Messi. I, I think he's a far more agreeable bloke than Maradona. I think it's, you know, his, his, uh, his treatment of those immediately around him is, is, is probably far better. The tax fraud in Spain. I mean, the vast majority of footballers seem to have been accused of tax fraud in yeah, Spain. I can, I can, I can, so, I, I can take that as goes with the territory. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I think that's to do with the Spanish system rather than rather than the individuals. Yeah. But taking money off the Saudis, I think, is pretty distasteful. Um, I, I I offer this as context rather than as a defence. I would say absolutely nobody in Argentina could care less about Qatari human rights mm. or Saudi human rights. Um, I think the world would be a better place if they did, but but they don't. Yes. Um, you've, so you've been looking at Argentina right through uh, the decades. Uh, the, uh, my memory, obviously, quite a bit shorter. So for me, uh, I, I, the Maradona era, I don't remember. And then we're into this period, I suppose, late 90s, early 2000s, where they produced such flair players and flatter to deceive at World Cups. And then we, we segued, I suppose, into the Messi era, where, where it was, can they do it for him, I suppose. Uh, certain aspects were always there. Uh, the the God, I don't even know what the right word is. The shithousery. Uh, is that uh, quintessentially Argentinian? Has always been there. Where does that come from? What What would you say to us about uh, the the fabric or the thread of Argentinian football that's been constant throughout the various eras? Yeah, I mean, oddly, Peckerman would absolutely be against that. Um, he he was somebody who really preached the, the gospel of fair play. Um, not, <laughs> admittedly, not much evidence of that. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, it's it's always been there. I, I, okay. I, well, I say it's always been there. Maybe that's not quite true. Uh, so going way back, so really from professionalism comes to Argentinian football in 1931. And from then on through to 58, they, they, they play this style called La Nuestra, which is all about you know, great technical attacking football. Nobody should run about too much. Definitely don't do, do any defending if you're a proper player. Um, and there's this sort of very complacent belief that they're the best in the world. Uh, and, and because uh, well, they sent an amateur team to the 34 World Cup, we lost to Sweden, but they were amateurs, so who cared? 
Uh, they'd lost in the final of the 1930 World Cup. And they don't play in another World Cup until 58 because Peron keeps them isolated. Um, and then they go to, to Sweden in 58, uh, lose to West Germany, they beat Northern Ireland, and then they get hammered 6-1 by Czechoslovakia. And that is this enormous humiliation for them. Um, and it ends overnight, the period of La Nuestra, and they say, no, we've got to... We got to find a way of fighting, and that then leads to, to the idea of anti-football and, and, and the Studiantes, you know, that famously violent team who won the three Libertadores in a row. And I, I think that's where the darkness entered Argentinian football. Um, and Aloma Minotti sort of said, "Oh, we're going back to the days of La Nuestra." It clearly, was there to an extent the '78 World Cup, and it's been, you know, to, to a greater or lesser extent. It's been there ever since. I mean, particularly, you'd say, the 1990 side under Bilardo. Um, and it's absolutely without shame. You know, <laughs> there's, there's no sense that, you know, Emmy Martinez throwing the ball away at the penalty shootout. There's no sense that that is in any way reprehensible. No, he's done the right thing because that's yeah. put off um, uh, Sherman and he's missed the penalty. So Martinez has won that. And, you know, he did similar things. Uh, the semi-final of the Cup of America last year against um, against Colombia. Um, so, and yeah, would it be no... right? Would it be right to say? Because again, it, it's something which is said, and it, it's good to speak to someone who's maybe looked into it a bit, in a bit more depth. Even Maradona's hand to God has an extra bit of relish because there was foul play involved in sticking it to the English. Like that, that's that's to be celebrated even a touch more. It's an extra bit of flavour. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that the, the you know the, the the classic Argentinian player is a player is the pibe the player from the streets, and the two things you learn playing on the streets are a technical skill because you're playing on uneven surfaces, very you know, a lot of people in a very small area, but you also learn how to look after yourself and how to to win without uh, you know the, the the contrast always with the English schools where there'd be a teacher there ready to blow the whistle if if um, if things got out of hand, mm. whereas playing on the Potreros and the vacant lots of Buenos Aires, you don't have that. You've got to be able to handle yourself. And that means sticking the elbow in when you need to. It means unsettling your opponent psychologically. It means doing all the cheating you can as long as you can get away with it. Okay. Is that is the face of, of that type of football likely to change with um, increased standards of living and less street football and academies, hot housing, young talent early on? Or, or where is Argentina on that front? No, I, th- I think it's just it's just ingrained. It's okay. just that's that's what's valued. I, I, and I mean, there's, as I say, there's absolutely no sense of, of shame. It, 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 they would regard it as it being a very sort of Western European hang up. The <laughs> idea that that yeah, f- fair play they see as being a weirdly English idea, <laughs> uh, and they they don't quite get it. They know it's something that, that we do, and but they, it, what, what's the point? What, what are you doing? That's not how the world is. <laughs> um, one last thought then: the celebrations in Argentina have been extraordinary. I think the team basically had to go by helicopter at a certain point because uh, the, the bus just wasn't quite cutting it with the crowds. And we saw the numbers that travelled and supported in Qatar as well. And uh, we see, be it Angel Di Maria, who's weeping for much of the final from the bench or in the stands or in the celebrations, there is a level of emotion here which which does seem a, a cut above the average. W- football's place in Argentina and why it seems to... Uh, prompt this kind of emotion. What, what's your sense of that? Uh, I think there's a couple of things. So I, I think the the first thing is when Argentina was was being formed as a nation, and, and this is a complex topic and I won't go into too much detail, but basically Argentina gains its independence from Spain in 1816. It then spends roughly 100 years sorting itself out, civil war. Um, there's a lot of British involvement. It's sort of a de facto part of the empire without actually becoming part of the empire. Uh, the British slowly disappear in the early 20th century and they're left around the time of the First World War with this very diverse population. Uh, so uh, roughly speaking, uh, I think it's around about two and a half million population of whom a million Spaniards or Spanish descent, uh, 800,000 Italian descent, 400,000 Northern European Jews, 400,000 Arabs, 40,000 Germans, 30,000 French, 30,000 British and Irish. And they come from very different places. They've got very different ideas of how to do things. But the one thing that binds them all together is when that team in the blue and white stripes goes out to play against Uruguay or Brazil or Chile, they want them to win. Mm. And so the way that team plays, um, the style in which they play, the success which they play, is a reflection of, of national character. And then as, as, as time's gone by, 
know, what else is Argentina known for? You know, I mean, tango dancing, I, I guess, was popular for a while, but, you know, name a tango dancer. Nobody can name a tango dancer. Um, or, yeah, only specialists can name tango dancers. What, why is Argentina famous? How does it impinge on the global consciousness? It's it's football and nothing else. So that, that that's why it still means so much. Wow, that's a super interesting answer. Yeah, amazing. Um, the book, if anyone's looking for more on this, um, and, and maybe, uh, I don't know, it, there'll be a, an edition soon, um, but it's Angels with Dirty Faces by Jonathan Wilson. I have to say, I, I, I didn't want to get into it at the start because it would just make the rest of the conversation seem irrelevant but as you talked about Qatar in 2070 being uninhabitable and yet you're walking down air conditioned streets which are further bringing on and contributing to climate change um man the and the, the grotesque and needless inequality the um the mass stupidity that we seem to be displaying as a race as a as a as a species rather is um it's quite something it would it would get in on you Jonathan if you spent too much time thinking about it yeah, it does, and you know, you you what what what, I, what is particularly difficult about it is you you raise the issues, and um, the yeah, some people take it on board, but fundamentally the response is either to shrug, or it's to to accuse you of, of hypocrisy or pointing out other abuses, or to to accuse you of of, of you know Islamophobia for pointing out just how ridiculous that tournament was. Mm. Well, I was uh, on that specific point. I was reading a piece in the Guardian. I think it was this morning that um, certainly a tactic of the hired PR companies was to accuse uh, journalists of racism because that would be one of the accusations that would really land and halt uh, people in their tracks. So, I mean, the the cynicism has kept going at every turn. Mm. I, I and yeah, where, where where's the yeah the racism of Qatar as a nation is obvious. Who are the people doing the work? Who are the people toiling on? In, in in the labor camps it's not it's not qataris it's yeah it's it's people from sub-saharan africa and from um from south asia and and you know the the the, the callousness with which he heard some of the people from the supreme committee talk about uh the deaths of um uh alex that that, that filipino yeah. worker who who was working on the on the the, the complex where the saudis had stayed or the the, the kenyan who who died the day of the um Argentina Netherlands game when he, he fell from the top of the sales stadium. Yeah, yeah. That 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 line of death is part of life. Yeah, particularly if you're a migrant worker. Uh Jonathan, thanks so much. That was a great conversation. Really appreciate it. Cheers, no worries. Thanks. Thank you. Jonathan Wilson, uh, football writer with us there on the line. And again, his book is Angels with Dirty Faces, the footballing history of Argentina. Uh, football show coverage brought to you by Sky. You can watch Man City Liverpool. Tomorrow in the Carabao Cup, it's live on Sky Sports. We'll take a short break. Graham Hunter is going to join us. Football on Off the Ball. With Sky, proud partner and supporter of the Republic of Ireland women's national football team. This is News Talk.